start with a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Dr. Mbieski. I've been programming in Scala since early 2016 and programming in general for over 10 years now. Uh, I contribute to Zio. I'm involved in several projects, uh, Zio Core, Zio Test, and Zio Macros. Um, you can find me under the nickname IOLEO on GitHub. And the quickest way to contact me is on Zio's Discord chat. I want to thank my current employer, IQVIA, for sponsoring my trip here. Uh, IQVIA's business is collecting data on healthcare industry and providing detailed reports on historical data as well as predictions based on that. We are currently transitioning into the cloud and we are hiring. So if you're interested in distributed systems, big data, machine learning, and looking for a job, head over to jobs.iqvia.com and <coughs> find out about currently open positions. I'm also involved with Scala. I started my Zero journey early this year on a workshop by John and organized by Scala. And they have since supported my efforts to learn and contribute back to the community. So thank you, Scala. You are the best. Um, and again, if you're looking for challenging projects and a friendly environment to work and grow as a professional, I really, really <coughs> recommend you to try Scala. Uh, they allow you to work remotely. Uh, so if you're interested, see scala.io careers to learn more. All right. So today we will be discussing the problem of complexity and how to tame it. And so first I will briefly state the problem. Um, then I will show you how to deal with it using Zion and how to test uh, our solution. Next, I will summarize the features and shortcomings of this approach. And finally, I will give you a glimpse of the future. So, um, let's talk a little about the problem. I will make a claim here that complexity is an emergent property of software projects <coughs> that grows organically as new requirements come in. And uh, yeah, it will cripple your team eventually uh, unless you plan ahead uh, how to do it. So to illustrate that claim, uh, I will give you an example from my own experience. A few years back, I joined the startup to work on a loyalty platform. Uh, one of our vital processes was the user registration. And yeah, it started with a simple process, uh, a proof of concept, uh, a simple uh, application receiving form data from front end and making a single query to the database. But then soon new requirements came in, the testers started breaking our simple application in all sorts of ways. So we had to add input validation. Then uh, new requirements came in and we, we wanted to add email confirmation, then phone number <coughs> information. Uh, it's, it was a loyalty platform. There was some uh, offers that we were having for each user. And the assumption in the whole system was that these offers are always there. They are new offers are generated at the beginning of each month. So when a new user came in, uh, we had to actually generate these offers also for him uh, so that our invariant stays true in the system. And then sometime later, uh, we were asked to add communication preferences because we wanted to allow our users to choose uh, in how often and through which channel they want to be bothered by our service. Um, yeah, and so on and so on and so on. So very quickly, what used to be a simple process became a complicated one with many orthogonal concerns, some of which are by themselves very complicated domains. For example, uh, sending emails, it's not an easy thing unless you delegate to some library that uh, does it for you, but uh, as it is, if you were to handle it on your own, it's not a, uh, an easy thing. So, and at some point, we were not able to add new features anymore uh, to this process. 
we had to take a step back and refactor our code uh, because the, the other concerns that uh, they dominated uh, our uh, code uh, heavily and it wasn't easy to test at some point. Yeah. So <laughs> how do we deal with complexity? The solution is modular design. Uh, so we split uh, our code base into small programs and we will have each program handle a single concern and then compose them into larger programs. And what this will do for us, um, each of these smaller programs will be easy to reason about and therefore it will be also very easy to implement and to test uh, and the code will be very small, most likely in a few lines. So you will be basically able to fit it all in your brain's quick memory uh, and reason about it. Yeah. All right. So before we proceed further and look into modularity in Zio, let's quickly review Zio itself. Uh, Zio is a modern library for asynchronous and concurrent programming that is based on functional programming. And at its core, it uses the Zio data type, which represents a description of a program that you might uh, run in the future. And it has three type parameters. The R, the first one, is the type of the environment that we need to provide to the program in order to run it. If it's any, it means there are no requirements. Uh, the E is the type of the error this program can produce. It is used to represent recoverable errors. So if it's nothing, <coughs> it means the program can fail. And finally, the A is the type of the value this program can produce. And again, if it's nothing, it means the program can never succeed. So either it will fail always, or it will never stop running. And on the other hand, if it's unit, it means it produces no useful information apart that it succeeded doing whatever it was doing. Oh. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, give me a second. And the switch my screens. Uh, uh, yeah, not okay for me, I don't see my notes. <laughs> um, this is a problem. Uh, holy shit. easy for me to recover if it happens again. All right, <coughs> so yeah, where were we? So an example program uh, 
could look like this. So the find user program requires the database connection to run. It can fail with a network error and it can return an option of a user. All right, so what you see on this slide is so-called module pattern as outlined by John in his blog post, uh, link down below. Uh, the top trait is called the module. It holds only one value and by convention it is named after the module which is a reference to the, uh, and this value is a reference to the actual service. And the service trait uh, is a regular interface that defines the capabilities that our module provides. And by convention, we place it in the companion object of the module. So, yeah, and taking advantage of Scala's intersection types, we can compose, um, multiple modules into a richer module that contains all of the services. So as long as the abstract values have unique names, then the order in which we mix in the modules doesn't matter. And we can express dependencies on other modules by simply putting them into the first type parameter of Zeo. So in this case, both the Register and confirm email capabilities, they require user storage to run. And in the implementation, we can use the environment combinator to pull out modules from the environment. And at runtime, the underlying object will actually be the full environment, but thanks to upcasting, we can <coughs> view it as a single module, the one we requested, and we'll be only able to work on what's inside the module, which is the, the service itself. So we map over it to pull out the actual service, and then we can use it to call on any capabilities it provides. So in this case, we call uh, save on the storage. And yeah. For convenience, we can define a helper object with capability accessors using the accessm combinator uh, given module in the environment. Uh, we can return an effect from that module. And then we can use these accessor helpers to simplify the code. So uh, this implementation of user logic type does exactly the same thing as the one on the previous slide. Uh, we just saved us uh, one line. So instead of calling Z or environment map, this is very verbose. We, we can simply uh, use this uh, static method on the user storage module object, uh, and it will do that job for us. All right. And to create an accessor for a capability that has dependencies, we need an environment with both the accessed service and its collaborator. So in this example, the register helper uh, depends <coughs> on user logic uh, to access the register capability and then to run this register uh, capability, we need user storage because it by itself requires it. And uh, you may note that in this example, I have forgotten to add a helper for confirm email capability, and we'll get to that uh, on the next slide. So you may also encounter a parameterized version of this pattern, and this is actually how the built-in Zio modules, uh, meaning console, clock, system, and random, uh, are encoded. Um, and for capabilities that have dependencies, this looks like this. So we're using R with the dependencies. And yeah, so this often confuses people. Why to introduce a parameter on the service tray and then in the live implementation lock it to any? I mean, what could possibly that uh, be useful for? But in fact, uh, it is useful. 
Its only purpose is to force us to implement accessors for all services capabilities, uh, because now our uh, singleton user logic module, uh, it extends the user logic service, and in the environment, it gets the user logic module itself, kind of circular logic, but yeah, <laughs> stay with me. Uh, and therefore, uh, <coughs> since we uh, extend the service, we need to implement uh, every, uh, every uh, method that uh, it defines. And this is good for, uh, otherwise we will get a compile time error. <coughs> and this is good for discoverability, uh, as uh, other developers will likely just type the module helper object, then dot, and then let their IDE hint them what is available in this module. Uh, so we don't want to forget about some capabilities that we have encoded. <coughs> all right. And all of this boilerplate, by the way, it can be auto-generated for you by the accessible macro from the Zio Macros project. And uh, the name of the accessor object is configurable by the uh, first parameter to the macro. Uh, I use the arrow because it's concise and when I use it, it looks almost as if I'm calling it directly on the module. So I like it, uh, but you can name it whatever you, you want. All right, now let's get to testing part. So this is how a Zio test looks like, uh, an example suit. Uh, I won't be covering uh, Zio test itself <coughs> in details. Uh, Adam did a great job mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, so I will be skipping the, the outer parts uh, on the rest of the slides and just focusing on the inside of the test. But yeah, so we can use the capability accessors uh, uh, in the test framework and we can combine them in uh, Plasma to create some uh, ad hoc scenarios to test. And yeah, for in this example, uh, this would be actually testing some live implementation. Uh, we're checking the user by the ID, uh, then saving him, and then checking again, and we assert that in the first case, uh, uh, the user was not present in the database, and in the second case, he already was there. All right. So this is maybe the simplest of the programs you can write. Uh, but it depends on the console service, and that's what's important here. Uh, so, to test capabilities that depend on some other modules, we can either provide some test implementation, and Zio provides one test implementation for each of the built-in modules, and you can find them in the Zio test environment uh, package. And yeah, so in this case, uh, we're creating a test console, which extends the regular <coughs> console. It just gives us some additional uh, methods to work with it. Uh, we instantiate it with the default data, which is empty. And yeah, and then we uh, create a console from it. Then we provide it to our program. And finally, uh, after our program is run, we are getting the, we are peaking on the output because the test console actually uh, writes to uh, writes to a vector. So then we can check if it works correctly. All right, I, I just got a message that I shot on time, so I'm skipping some of these slides. This can be shortened because the uh, runtime of, of the test. Uh, actually already provides all the test implementations, so you don't need to uh, literally add them. So right, uh, now, yeah, let's skip that one. All right, the alternative to providing a test implementations, which is easy for the default ones because they are already written for you, but for yourself, uh, you might not want to write uh, test implement dummy implementations uh, by yourself because like, if you're a fan of test-driven development like me, uh, I want to start by writing my expectations as a test and then I don't want the first thing I do 
to be implementing a fake, uh, making a fake implementation so I, that I can run my, uh, start uh, writing my test and then later write a real implementation. So uh, uh, the alternative is to create ad hoc implementations using the ZEO mock machinery. And in, for that, we need uh, to define capability tags. And that will serve as unique identifiers to our calls and a mock implementation that uh, delegates calls to the underlying mock machinery. And uh, this again can be auto-generated for you by the mockable macro, so you don't need to worry about that. All right. So having all that machinery in place, we can create ad hoc implementations that do exactly and only what this test requires. Uh, so in this case, uh, we want first uh, define capability to be called on our user storage uh, with a parameter equal to ID. And in that case, we want it to return a value of none. And then later, we want the safe capability to be called with our user and return unit. And then we can provide this uh, uh, mock implementation that we just created uh, to, to the actual program. Uh, there is some implicit convention here in the background, which converts from our uh, expectations into a managed with our um, module inside. Uh, but you don't need to add any imports for that because uh, it's always uh, in the scope of the implicit search uh, algorithm. Uh, uh, yeah, so it works out of the box, and you can do that with multiple dependencies. So you can. Uh, write uh, different mocks for different uh, uh, modules and then you can uh, uh, combine them together using zip and then you have to map over it and construct the richer environment uh, by rewriting the services inside. Yeah. Alright, so let's get to the summary. Um, what's the good stuff? So you can get started with Zio right now, solving complex problems. Uh, by breaking them down into small programs and composing. And it's easy to test. You can create small test programs by combining the capabilities. And you can uh, also create ad hoc mock implementations tailored uh, to your test. Everything is type safe. If you fail to provide any dependency, you will get a compile time error. And thanks to contravariance, uh, the type of the R parameter will be always inferred the correct way by the Scala compiler, so you can rely on it. And there is no magic behind the scenes, no implicit that you have to import. We do use implicits in Zio, like I said, but uh, they are always in scope. Uh, so you don't have to worry about them. And macros are only used to generate boilerplate code for you. Uh, but the work is uh, really mechanical and you could easily write that on your own. There's nothing magical about it. And yeah, so you can be very agile, starting with a simple prototype and slowly build up to get to the final solution. Uh, so we saw a great example yesterday in the ray tracing talk by Pierre Angelo Sechetto. I, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but thank you. Uh, I, it was great talk and fun to watch. Yeah. Now let's talk briefly about the bad stuff and the shortcomings of this approach. Because <laughs> 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 there's an important point I want to make. So basically, this has one shortcoming that I really don't like, as that you have these transitive dependencies. Uh, so if your program uh, and your module, your program depends on some other module, and that depends on some other module. You just get this trail of transitive dependencies that you have to keep <coughs> in your interface, and that's not nice to work with. And let's imagine we add a DB connection dependency in the user storage. Then we would have to add it to the user logic, user <coughs> etc., etc. Et and so the other thing that's not nice is modifying the environment, you have to do it manually. Um, okay, so can we do better? Can we solve that somehow? So let's quickly show what I actually did is uh, I proposed a slightly modified version of it where I expressed the dependencies as abstract values 
And uh, the difference is that I remove them from the interface and the dependency is actually only in the live implementation. So you could have different implementations with different dependencies. And what this makes is that uh, you don't have this trail of dependencies uh, in your environment. But on the other hand, when <coughs> you try to finally instantiate your environment to create it, uh, then you will need to fulfill the contract. These, all of these uh, uh, absolute values will have to be filled in. Uh, so you get the compile time check that you will have. <coughs> so this is kind of the best of the world, world both, both worlds. Uh, yeah. And uh, you could also do that using self type requirements, but uh, I show that in, in this documentation. Uh, basically, the errors when you fail to provide some dependency <coughs> are much nicer when you use the absolute values. So that's the top one. And with self type requirements, you get the train wreck you know, of traits, and you have to, yeah, where is Wally? Where is the missing uh, in, uh, trait? All right, and for modifying the environment, you have other macros written by Maxim, and he will talk about that probably in, in his talk a bit more. So let's quickly get to the future. And I'm also working on an eight set implementation, and I'll just quickly slide over that, but I, it should be soon. And one of the other problems uh, I'm working on <coughs> is to extract this, uh, uh, mach uh, this mock machinery that right now sits in your production code, in your main, not in your test uh, scope. So uh, I'm working uh, to make the macro configurable so you can actually only do that in your uh, test scope. So right, that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming, for listening. If you want to learn more, check out my blog post and uh, the associated repository and these uh, links. Yeah.